For those of you joining us here today, we're going to be talking about getting your PhD in seven easy steps, starting with step number five, because uh, Brian mentioned like steps one through four. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, so he'll talk about that in the presentation. I've known Brian for many, many years. I sat next to him on a uh, bench at some point in front of a net worth tournament. And then I think he went on to like do really well in it. Uh, so Brian is knowledgeable, skilled, and has worked at Black Hills for over nine years mm -hmm. and is one of our best testers. You do threat hunting too, right, Brian? development yes, hunting, defensive side the whole yeah. pretty much all of it so yeah so brian has a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge to share with us and we'll be here today if you're in discord uh feel free to ask questions or make comments at any time we love that stuff mm -hmm. uh, if you have any questions at any time feel free to ask in the zoom questions and answers and we'll do the best we can to ask all your questions at the end brian do you have anything before we start no nothing for me all right it's all yours we'll see you in a little bit okay sounds great all right, uh, so as uh, Jason said, uh, we're going to uh, talk about getting your PhD in seven easy steps, starting on step five. So let me click the right screen and we're off. Uh, so about me, well, I'm Brian. I'm the one giving the webcast and I'm just going to throw in, I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is hands down best sport ever. Lots of slides, so we're going to skip all the other uh, intro stuff there. So what's the, the goals of this presentation? Well, some of you might be interested in getting a PhD or maybe you're not interested in getting one at all, but you're just kind of curious what that process looks like. So uh, with this, we can hopefully kind of uh, remove some of the, uh, a little bit of the mystery uh, surrounding that process. And it, this also gives me an opportunity to discuss what I'm actually working on. So we can open this up for feedback, criticisms, suggestions, whatever the community might have. So as I mentioned, I would break this down into kind of uh, seven different steps with the first four steps really not being that interesting, being kind of straightforward, not making for a very good webcast. So uh, you've got your required coursework, which can vary depending on the school you're going to. Uh, typically, once you've gone through a certain amount of coursework, you're going to have your comprehensive exams. So these might be oral, they might be written, they might be both. In my case, they were oral exams, which are uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> Definitely good to be well prepared for those when you are getting a test and you have to give an answer right on the, the spot. So after you've, you've gone through that, you're going to come up with uh, what's called, or you're going to go through uh, idea synthesis, basically. So you're going to need to come up with an idea for what you want to research. What do you want to work on? Where can you make an improvement or add knowledge to the, uh, to the overall body of knowledge? After you've done this, you're going to want to do a literature review. So you got to make sure, has somebody already done this before? What other work has been done that supports the work that you're doing? And you want to build a good foundation for you to build upon to make sure of where your work fits in and where it moves the bar along within that field. Now, once you've done this, you're going to put together a proposal. Now, this will be a formal document that you put together. Uh, in my case, it's a long 60 page uh, document that I'm happy to share out if anybody wants to see what that actually looks like. Uh, but once you put that together, you're going to propose that to your PhD committee and they will give you feedback and either accept it or request that you make uh, changes to it. At this point, you then become a PhD candidate or you'll see somebody call this ABD, uh, all but defended, all but dissertation, meaning research work is what's left. Then you do your research work, uh, you know, go through it, actually, you know, do do what you said you're going to do, write it all up, defend that in front of your committee, and then um, then you hopefully have your PhD at that point. So today we're going to go through the uh, the proposal. And so now this is the original presentation in its original form. I did give this about a year ago. So I'm just going to caveat this with some of the ideas and directions have changed uh, because really the PhD can be a fluid process and that that is important uh, that you are uh, you don't get a uh, tunnel vision you don't get stuck on anything so with that we're going to go ahead and jump into the proposal itself so titled investigating machine learning vba macro analysis using machine learning in a constrained environments uh, definitely just rolls right off the tongue uh, i am going to south dakota school of mines and technology for their data science and engineering program so just to give a quick overview, I will introduce the, the subject, the background, we'll pose the research questions, talk about what people have done previously within this field, talk about the work I'm proposing, give what was a very optimistic timeline, and then we will wrap things up. So hacking, uh, this is a 
term that was actually coined all the way back in uh, the 50s and 60s, and it didn't always have a nefarious meaning. It really what it meant is people who displayed the new technology that came out. It wasn't until like the 70s or 80s that people started giving it more of that uh, nefarious uh, meaning to it, where you got that picture on the bottom, the person in the hoodie hacking away, you know, doing whatever it is that they're doing there. I don't know. So. Uh, moving on, talking about data breaches. Now, Verizon puts out a report yearly uh, in which they talk about uh, basically all the different data breaches that happened for the year prior. And they define that as an incident that results in actual disclosure of data, not just potential exposure uh, to an unauthorized party. And when it comes to data breaches, social engineering, uh, according to the same Verizon report, is one of the main ways that people are getting a foothold into organizations. And phishing, breaking down social engineering further, phishing is a popular tactic for the, the social engineering campaigns. Now, what does phishing usually look like? Typically, this is going to involve sending out emails to targets, uh, to recipients. Now, with these emails, we can include file attachments, you know, documents, spreadsheets, whatever else you might put on there. But you might also try to uh, include a link instead, because sometimes email filtering on attachments can be pretty good. So maybe put a link to, to the payload instead of attaching it directly. And depending on the, uh, the threat actor's goals, uh, the, the payload might differ. They might be trying to just get malware into the environment. So maybe they can spread ransomware. Maybe they're trying to get data that they can sell. Maybe it's a banking scheme and they're trying to, um, you know, a banking Trojan to try to get money, steal credentials used elsewhere. You know, it all depends. So one of the things that, uh, that we can look at using for these, uh, for these payloads are Microsoft Office macros. Now, what is a macro? Basically, they allow for automating tasks within different Microsoft Office files. And basically, anything that you can do with a keyboard or mouse, you can make a macro do. And these are written using a language called Visual Basic for Application, or just VBA. And this is actually pretty popular with threat actors. In 2021, it was reported that 43% of all downloaded malware was related to Microsoft Office macros. And down there, we have uh, basically our Hello World VBA style, if you're curious what the language actually looks like. Now, there are some defenses that are in place for this. Uh, the first line of defense when it comes to the phishing is the email filtering. But this can be kind of hard to enforce. I mean, basically what you have to say is that no documents are allowed. No office files are allowed to be sent as attachments. And that's just, um, for some organizations, that's just not feasible. It's not reasonable. So there are some other built-in protections and uh, granted there, there's another layer on top of this now, but this one still does exist uh, to where when you open up an office file and if it has a macro, you might get something like this that says, oh, hey, uh, the macros have been disabled, but it's easy to persuade people to go ahead and enable them. You can put in something like this on the bottom where it says, oh, hey, uh, this content that's in the document, this has been encrypted because of privacy reasons. Uh, all you got to do is you just got to click that button up top. It'll decrypt the information and you can see what it is. Now, we also have uh, macro uh, defenses at the antivirus level. So antivirus vendors are well aware of malicious macros. They know about these and Microsoft is no exception. And so that's when we're going to talk about Microsoft Defender antivirus. So this is something that has actually been included for free since Windows Vista. Uh, yeah, I mean, Windows Vista, something we usually just try to forget about, but one of the good things that came about it was, was Defender. And so with Defender, uh, they have a mixture of uh, both uh, signature-based analysis. So essentially they've seen this exact file before, they can go ahead and alert on it. Uh, static analysis, so they're looking at features of the file to try to determine that it's malicious or not. And they also have dynamic analysis. So once the code in the file actually runs, they can look at the behavior of that and try to determine what is it that it's actually doing. And they actually use machine learning analysis as, as part of this uh, process. And so what they'll do is they have a local model where they will locally uh, do the machine learning locally first. And if they can't make a good, competent decision on whether or not it's benign or malicious, then they can upload it to the cloud for further analysis. So before moving on, I want to talk a little bit about machine learning. This is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit. It's something we hear about a lot. But, but what does that actually mean? What is, what is machine learning? 
And so basically what it is, is we're trying to imitate the way that humans learn using a set of data and algorithms to try to improve the accuracy um, of whatever task we're, we're doing. And so th this usually has three steps to it. We usually have a decision process. So basically we're taking in data and we're going to try to discern patterns from that data or make a decision or classification based on that data. We then have an error function. That error function tells us how good did we do? Did we do a great job at, at picking out this data uh, patterns, uh, classification, or was it really bad? How far off were we? Then we have an update step. So basically we're refining this decision process. We're trying to reduce the errors that we made. We're updating our algorithm to try to get a better decision process, reduce the error function, and you just keep looping until you reach some kind of an exit condition and you say, this is good enough. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Defender does use machine learning and obviously they're not going to disclose exactly what they use for a lot of different reasons. I mean, if they do, that makes it a lot easier to attack it, but also uh, the machine learning is something that is, uh, they can make money off of, right? So it's not something that they just wanna give away, but they do give out clues. So they mentioned that they typically use supervised machine learning models for most of their algorithms. They will use an ensemble of methods such as neural networks and decision trees, uh, meaning that they group together multiple machine learning models uh, within a larger single model called an ensemble to try to uh, get a better decision, uh, the decision made at the end of this. And they actually retrain their models daily on millions of rows of data, typically with hundreds of thousands of features per row. So this is one huge advantage that Microsoft has in the machine learning space. It's just the sheer amount of data uh, to which they have access. So we're gonna move on to talking about how can we attack machine learning? So one of the new areas of research when it comes to machine learning is what's called, what are called adversarial attacks. Now machine learning has been around for quite a while. Adversarial attacks are relatively new. And these attacks can target different phases of the machine learning process. Some of these attacks will target the training phase, which is often referred to as data poisoning. So basically you are putting in bad data that the algorithm is going to use to learn. And that way, when it makes a decision, it is going to make a poor decision because it was given, a, it was given poor data, uh, garbage in, garbage out, as they say. Other, tar other uh, phases that are targeted are the testing and prediction phase, and these could be things like uh, data extraction attacks, oracle attacks, evasion attacks, and those are what we're going to talk about here. Now, this is a very common uh, picture that you will see if you go and you Google adversarial attacks, you will probably see literally this image here or some variation of it. So here, um, a, a lot of the adversarial attacks that are being done, a lot of the work that's being done is focusing on images and videos. And so in this case, what we have is we have an image classifier. So this is something where you give it an image and it tells you what is in the image. And this, is, this model has already been trained. And on the left, we can see that it was fed an image of a pig and it correctly classified it as a pig. Now, what's happening here, uh, as you go towards the right, is we're adding some noise to that image. The noise is not random, it is very calculated. And what you get out on the right is something that definitely still looks like a pig. I mean, to me, anyways, that looks like a pig. Uh, in Discord, you can tell me what else you think that looks like, that'll be fun. Uh, but nonetheless, to me, that looks like a pig, but the classifier now class says that it is an airliner. So that's an, one example of an adversarial attack. So <clears throat> talking about um, Oracle and model extraction attacks. So this is where we have a machine learning algorithm that is already trained. And we wanna know, we want to basically be able to replicate this model ourselves. And one way we can do that is we have the model set up, we give, uh, put data into the model and it gives us a prediction. And we use those predictions and that data to basically determine how it is making those decisions. So that if I give it this set of data, it's going to give me this, this decision. If I give it this set, it'll give me this decision. And we iterate through this process until basically we have our own model that replicates the functionality of that other trained model that we might not have full access to. And from there, we can try to figure out, okay, 
how exactly is it making these, these decisions? What features are important? Uh, what, what do I need to change in order to get some different outcome from this particular model? So just tell a quick story about um, what really motivated this work for me. Uh, Black Hills has kind of a side project that we've been working on for a while called Trackback, which is basically something that tries to help uh, find the physical location of cyber criminals, if you will. So let's just say people maybe out on the dark web who are trying to buy things that they should not be trying to buy. Uh, we we want to try to help catch those people, right? So one thing you can do is using uh, macro enabled documents, we can, we can basically social engineer these people and say, hey, uh, I've got what you want. It's in this document. Uh, go ahead and open this up and you'll get what you need. Uh, they open up the document. The macro runs and uh, we can kind of help, we can determine exactly where they are in the world, regardless of what other uh, obfuscation techniques they have in front of them. The problem though, is that these macros that we use, they look a lot like malware because really, I mean, they basically are. And Defender doesn't really care that we're the good people. It doesn't care about that. What it sees is it sees, um, it sees that uh, we have malware. And, and at this point, I, I wanna mention too, that I'm not picking on just Defender, um, it, you know, just because I actually, I, I love Microsoft. I think they make great products. Uh, so really we could be talking about different antiviruses here. We just pick Defender because it's free, it's available, it's on the computer, and it could uh, potentially be what other people might have. So just wanna throw that out. So it's kind of the background for the project. Let's move into the research uh, portion here, uh, the research questions. So here's the problem statement. Phishing attacks definitely aren't going away anytime soon. Uh, cyber criminals aren't just gonna shout out and say where they are. And in both cases, uh, macro enabled documents might be involved. And so the hope here is to provide some uh, both tooling and knowledge that could be used by either security vendors, law enforcement, or both. And Defender, again, is just serving as our proof of concept here. Nothing against them. It's just, it's convenient. We'll say that. So uh, the challenges, what are some of the challenges that we're facing here? As I mentioned, Microsoft has a lot of data and they also have a lot of computing power and it's gonna be hard to, uh, to match that. Uh, this is definitely not going to be feasible to determine every single feature that is used by uh, Defender when it comes to training its algorithms. And I would also like to be able to, uh, to be able to, ex uh, once we extract the models, to be able to explain how those decisions are being made so that we can intelligently craft new uh, macro samples, new code samples based upon those decisions that uh, the Defender is making and how it is making those decisions. But the last challenge here, which is a really tough one, is the way in which we can uh, change the macros is highly constrained by the language itself. So it's not like with the images where we, uh, you know, it's still going to be an image afterwards. Uh, if we make uh, certain changes to the code itself, it might, not, it might no longer function, and that's a problem. So here are the formal research questions. Uh, given the limited computing power and training data, what techniques can we use to in help infer the decision boundaries of Defender's macro analysis in an explainable fashion? Why is it making the decisions that it does? When it comes to the macro classification, which features are most important in that classification? And when we try to modify the code, uh, what are the limiting factors in being able to do that while still maintaining the functionality of the code? So the objectives of this, kind of reiterating some of the stuff from earlier is uh, knowledge and tooling that hopefully Microsoft can use to find gaps in its machine learning models. Uh, hopefully they can use this for, uh, for their own purposes because really at the end of the day, we wanna help people tighten up their security. Uh, that's, that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> also to provide knowledge and tooling that law enforcement can help use to catch some of the, uh, the bad people out there, if you will better insight into what actually makes a macro malicious. I mean, what's what's the difference between a, a good macro that wants to run a program and a bad macro that wants to run a program? I mean, there are legitimate use cases for macros, otherwise they wouldn't exist. And we're also going to look into the, uh, hopefully come up with some techniques of how we can automatically modify the macros, but not break them. So of course, now is a good time to get into the prior work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the background of Office files, if you will, because it's good to understand these. So Office files come in two main formats. You've got the compound, 
compound file binary format, which is going to be your Office 97 to 2003. And then going to Office 2007 and upward, they switch to what is called Open Office Open XML. Not to be confused with Open Office, that is a different thing, uh, Office Open XML. So talking about the first one, compound file binary, uh, it's also known as a component object model or object linking and embedding or OLI, uh, usually see one of those. Uh, the way that these documents are composed together is through what are called stream objects and storage objects. Stream objects are essentially the files in there. Storage objects are directories that contain those files. And so pretty interesting. I didn't honestly didn't know this up until a couple of years ago and blew my mind. You can take uh, something like 7-Zip or another archive utility, open up an Office document, and you will actually see some kind of a file structure uh, depending on uh, what, what year it is. And so, um, so you can go through and you, you can browse that. And within this uh, CFB style format, the macros are actually stored in a, a storage object called macros. And you can see that over on the right with some further uh, substructures of where the, uh, the macros are actually contained. Now, moving on to the more modern version of how Office files are stored, it's actually uh, kind of, it's a basically documents that are in XML format. You can still uh, open this up with a, a zip archive utility and you'll see something like over on the right, and in this case, the macros are stored in a binary file that is just named VBA project.bin. Uh, so it's a proprietary binary format. Uh, they, they have released what the specs on that are, and there are uh, different projects out there that you can use to extract out the information. That's where they live right now with the newer versions. And so in case you've ever wondered what the different um, extensions for Office files are, if you see it, something with an X on the end, that means it's uh, 2007 or newer or the Office Open XML format without macros enabled. If you see an M, it's that same 2007 or newer with macros enabled. If you don't see either, that means it's uh, 97 to 2003, the CFB format, just in case you're ever wondering about that. So where did the macros come from? Well, again, these are formally known as VBA macros, Visual Basic for Application macros. And really what these are is they're a cut down version of Visual Basic. I'm not gonna say that it's a subset of Visual Basic because that's not entirely accurate, but it's more of just, just kind of a cut down version, I guess is the best way I can put it. This was actually introduced all the way back in 1993. And not surprisingly, people have been weaponizing this since about the mid nineties, not long after it came out. So, in attacking, in performing attacks uh, against uh, machine learning models and classifiers, it can often help to know how the detections are being done. What are different people out there doing to try to detect uh, that something is malicious or if it's benign? And when it comes to doing the detection, feature extraction really is one of the first steps in most cases. And doing good feature extraction is likely going to be key for the work that I am proposing here. Now, one method that some people have used is, uh, is working off of what's called natural language processing. And so essentially uh, taking um, you know, a series of words that are put together and, and trying to extract out information from how those words are put together or the content of, of the, uh, the words, the actual words that are used. So uh, there are a couple different approaches that are typically used with this. There's what's called bag of words, uh, term frequency inverse document frequency, and doc to vec. We'll talk about each of those. Bag of words is the most straightforward of these. Basically what it is, is you take all the unique words in a document and you count the frequency of how many times each word appears. And then you can make a vector out of that. Uh, so you can see that down in the diagram where it appears six times, I appears five times. So it's pretty straightforward, right? You just, just count up the number of times each word appears. A slightly more sophisticated version is what's called term frequency inverse term frequency times inverse document frequency or TFIDF. Again, another one that just rolls right off the tongue like butter or something. And this is basically a more sophisticated version of bag of words. And what this is trying to do is it tries to determine not just the frequency of words, but how important is each word. And it does this by essentially looking at or favoring words that appear 
and fewer documents. So if you have a word that appears in every single document, like the word me or I or at or going or something like that, um, that's probably not all that interesting of a feature, right? It's, it's everywhere. I don't really care that much about it. Uh, but if you have something like the word shell, and that only appears in three out of the 100 documents, okay, that's interesting. And this is what that, this method is, uh, tries to capture that. So there's another approach that people take too. And with both the bag of words and the term frequency inverse document frequency, neither of these actually account for the relative position of terms. So if you have two words that are together in a sentence, that likely has some importance, some significance. Those aren't just completely independent from one another, right? Those have uh, some relationship to one another. And those first two methods don't really capture that. And that's where Doc Devec comes in uh, and tries to basically capture the importance of that context. And it's built upon something called word to vec so um, the authors that, I, that have done some of the previous work that, or some of the work from those previous slides, they looked at uh, using those methods for detecting malicious macros. And what they did was they trained a couple different types of models. So they have a random forest classifier, a support vector classifier, and a multi-layer perceptron were, were the ones that they picked. And what they found when it came to detecting macros, their best result was with the uh, multi-layer perceptron using the term frequency, not the TFIDF, but just the term frequency, which is also called bag of, word, bag of words, <coughs> excuse me, uh, instead of the um, kind of the more powerful TFIDF, which is kind of interesting that the, uh, the less sophisticated method actually gave them better results. So these same people also uh, tried out using um, what's called latent semantic analysis to try to do uh, to look at dimensionality reduction of their features. And this involved what was called singular value decomposition. So for any of the math people on here, I'm sure you know exactly what that means for, uh, for non-math uh, people. Singular value decomposition is basically you're trying to um, represent, capture the essence of information with less information. So like, let's think about um, a low resolution picture versus a high resolution one, or even like, you know, my camera here isn't that great. So you can tell that it's me. You can see there's a chair and probably a dog and all this other stuff, but maybe you can't see the pores on my face or something. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, you get most of the information without having to have all of the information. And it just helps with uh, processing, basically, to help simplify things. They also looked at accounting for timestamps of documents, making sure that when they're doing their training, that they're training on older documents. And when they're doing their testing, the documents they test on come after those documents they trained on. Because if you're trying to do... Uh, basically do future predictions, trying to predict what might happen in the future. Uh, you want to make sure that that future data isn't included in your training data. Otherwise, you're kind of skewing the results there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting point that they, they brought up. So what are some other ways we can go about feature extraction besides the natural language processing? Well, uh, we have some, some work that's been done on that. We, when it comes to macros specifically, we can look at things like function calls. What are the different calls that, that are being done within the macros? Are there encoded strings present within these documents? So they have base64 strings, hex encoded strings, uh, whatever else you know might be in there. Is there different encoding that's being used? Do the macro uh, does the macro code contain PowerShell scripts directly? I mean, have people just plopped in full on PowerShell scripts in, in the macros? That would be a good a good feature to look at. Uh, some people looked at DNS calls. Uh, in the work that I looked at, that I read about, they were actually looking at it from a dynamic standpoint. So they're looking at network logs, DNS logs, but you could also do it statically, right? I mean, you could look for URLs within the code, use that as features if you'd like. Also, the entropy of code, essentially, how random is it? Is it just a bunch of uh, gobbledygook, if you will, when you look at it? Or does it have more of a structure that it looks like a person would actually sit down and code? Also, things such as uh, average parameters of functions. So if there are function calls, do we have uh, functions uh, that are being called with 10 arguments, 20 arguments, one argument? These are all different things we can look at. 
When it comes to features too, we can also do what's called uh, feature engineering, which is basically where we are combining features together. So we take uh, you know, more two or more features that would normally be standalone and put those things together. So one, one example of this is let's say that a document has or a macro has the word uh, shell uh, as a command within the, the macro. And it also has a call to MSHTA. Well, we can make that a feature. So we make that a feature called MSHTA remote execution when it has both of those. So now we have a new feature created from other features. We can also look at things like uh, the number of variables that have uh, numerical values in their name. Um, we can look at the basically the number of statements that are used in, in a variable um, assignment. I mean, how many variables are we, uh, you know, how, how much is to the to the right side of that assignment, essentially? How many statements does it take to actually assign a value to a single variable? And we can also look at uh, things like function calls. Do we have a lot of small functions, a lot of large functions somewhere in between? These are all things that we can look at as features when we're trying to um, trying to make decisions on macros. So another thing we can look at is the presence of obfuscation. Some authors uh, looked looked into that, and so basically they looked they broke it down into four ways that macros are typically obfuscated. So we've got uh, random obfuscation. So basically we are replacing just the, the names of variables and functions throughout the code. We also have split obfuscation, which is basically we, we have a string and we take that string and we can split it up into a bunch of different chunks and then reform it later using multiple methods rather than having the string in its entirety shown within the code. We can also do encoding things. So we talked about this earlier, base64, hex encoding, whatever your favorite encoding scheme is, can look for that. As well as logic obfuscation. So do we have a bunch of code in there that seems like it shouldn't be in there? Just a bunch of while loops that do nothing, a bunch of math operators. Uh, these are all things that they had looked at, we could look for as well. So, Moving on from the detection portion of it, so all that was work that people have done on detecting malicious macros, we can go into the evasion portion of it. What are people doing to evade defenses? Well, so there are multiple tools out there. Some of you might be looking at this already and just saying, oh, hey, like there's there's tools out there that, that do this. I can run my, my macro through this, uh, through this tool and it gives me something out that might bypass AV. Yes, correct. Uh, but most of these will, uh, they do a couple different things here. And there's just, this is just, this isn't a comprehensive list. This is just, a, you know, some of the main ones that are out there. Um, a lot of these will use the obfuscation methods that I mentioned previously. A lot of them are just uh, simple, uh, we'll say variable or uh, name, function name, variable name replacement, or string splitting are some of the, the more common obfuscation methods that get used. So you just, you give it your code and what comes out is variables have been renamed and strings have been split out. And so the, those are, uh, that's kind of one of the common approaches, but they're, they're modifying the macros without knowing exactly what is causing the detection. So here we have an idea that it might be alerting on keywords or it might be a full uh, signature-based detection to where it's seen this piece of macro code before. And now we just need to modify it a little bit so it looks different, but they don't know exactly, exactly what is causing it to be alerted on. Is it because it is this, this variable is named this name or is it because this name has these different characteristics? You know, it's this long with uppercase, lowercase numbers. We don't know, we're just kind of blindly changing things. Another approach that some of these will use is sandbox detection or sandbox evasion. So they'll see if they're running in a sandbox environment, and if so, either don't execute or do something else that's not malicious. So some of these same authors, uh, these people came up quite a bit in my literature review. Um, these are the same people mentioned earlier with the, uh, the bag of words and um, related NLP stuff. So they looked at attacking NLP detection algorithms. They actually were attacking their own model that they had put together. And so they just used text substitution to see uh, essentially which of the models is most vulnerable. And they found that a uh, bag of words was the most vulnerable when it came to uh, text substitution and latent, latent semantic analysis was the least vulnerable. And so this is what I call an open box attack meaning that they knew what the model looks like because they built the model, they have full access to the model. And so they know uh, 
you know, really how it's going to make the decisions it's going to make. And that certainly aids within uh, how they're going to make these changes when they're attacking it. So there are some other attacks against NLP models, uh, something called uh, ADV expander. And so uh, again, these are just to point out, these aren't for macros in particular. These are actually, these, the ones in this work that I'm mentioning here were against just text processing models in general, but really similar, it's kind of similar, right? It's a similar problem, if you will. And so what they did here is rather than doing text substitution, they did what's called text expansion. So they add words into places rather than changing the words that are there. So interesting approach. So we talked about the evasion portion, detection portion. Let's talk about model extraction, going, going back to that. So again, here, what we're wanting to do within the extraction attack is I have a model that I am attacking and I want to know how is that model making the decisions that it's making so that way I can better craft my, my data that I'm going to then feed back into it to try to get it to flip that classification one way or another. Um, I wanna know how it's making those decisions. And one way you can do that is by making your own model uh, that tries to mimic that, that target model and then extract out information based upon that. Now, uh, some authors had looked into attacking uh, decision trees, a bunch of different models. Decision trees support vector machines, deep neural networks, and logistic regression models. Now, depending on what model you're attacking, you're going to have to take a different approach. So when it comes to things like regression models and deep neural networks or support vector machines, these are very mathematical. Like most of these, you can actually boil down to, if you want, a series of math equations. They're going to be really ugly, but you can do it. You can actually fully represent these with mathematical equations. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that if they know essentially what the equations are, they just need to find the parameters for those equations. And so they can play around with those parameters of the equations until they get a model that represents the, uh, or that mimics their target model. But when it comes to something like a decision tree, that's different. This isn't just a, a really a basic math formula. A decision tree is essentially, uh, you, you start up here and it's going to essentially go left or right down this tree. Like, oh, is, uh, you know, is this person um, over six feet or under six feet? You know, go, go left if over six feet, go uh, right if under six feet. And, uh, you know, go brown hair or red hair and just keep going down until class five, whatever. I don't really have an and for that. It just, I don't know, features that popped into my head for some reason, I guess, because I'm on the camera over here. But anyways, that's something that you can't really boil down to a math equation. And so you have to take more of an iterative search approach uh, in which you're just kind of uh, throwing things at it um, and trying to figure out how it's making the decisions that it's making uh, by kind of building your own model as you go. Um, in both cases, the, uh, the authors attempted to perfectly recreate uh, the model, which brings us to the next point. When it comes to model extraction attacks, there are two ways to go about it. So there's what's called high fidelity in which you are duplicating the behavior of your target model. This means if it makes a wrong decision, you also want to make that same wrong decision. And so in our case, uh, talking about an AV classifier, if it classifies it as benign when it was malicious, I want my model to do the exact same thing. Versus the next, uh, the next approach is high accuracy in which you're trying to best the target model. So you are trying to outperform it. It might have incorrectly classified something. So it might have incorrectly classified it as benign, but your model is smarter and it classifies it as malicious. That's not actually what we want here because uh, that's not going to help us as much. So in here, high fidelity is definitely the goal. So looking at how we can extract out uh, the models, basically uh, just kind of um, just, uh, this is just expanding on one of the pictures we saw earlier in which you have a data set, an untrained model, and your target model, and you're throwing data at the target model. It gives you a response back. Now you use those predictions and data to train your untrained model. You create new samples based upon the information you have, and you repeat this until uh, some kind of until you think things are good enough. Your model closely 
uh, mimics the behavior of your target model. So <clears throat> when it comes to uh, to malware portion of this with the uh, with the model extraction, there has been this this is where a lot of work hasn't really been done. So a lot of the work that's been done is more um, in the feature space where you've extracted out features and you're just playing with values in a spreadsheet essentially, rather than what's called problem space where you are actually changing the things that make those features. You are making changes to the code. You're making changes to the program to affect. Uh, how that, that feature extraction process uh, plays out. And so some people, uh, these authors here, they looked at taking uh, Windows binary files and they tested them against uh, multiple antivirus vendors that they knew were using machine learning models. They get the labels from the, uh, the antivirus vendors or the, the antivirus software, and then they use those to locally train their own model they then use what is called uh, MAB malware framework to create samples to try to bypass the detection of the, um, of the AV software. And so rather than throwing their detections continuously at the AV uh, software, they throw it against their locally trained model. And then they roll back the, the changes they made to the binaries until they found the minimum number of changes needed to be able to bypass their local model with the hope being that if they can bypass their local model, that hopefully they will be able to bypass the, uh, the AV software on which they built the local model. So it just gives them a little bit more uh, room to play around, I guess you could say before uh, their stuff is getting picked up. So, the closest thing to the work that I'm proposing here is, uh, was, was by these authors. And what they did was they targeted Windows AV in 2009, which was actually prior to it using machine learning that came out in about 2015. And again, they focused on binary files is, instead of uh, macros, which is what we're focusing on here. And the um, basically they threw the samples up against uh, Windows AV. They used those results to train a decision tree type classifier. Uh, when you have a decision tree, you can then go through the paths that the tree took to come to arrive at a classification. And you can better determine how were those samples being classified? What characteristics caused it to be classified benign instead of malicious or vice versa? So moving on to the proposed work, uh, just kind of reiterate, this is the same slide we saw earlier, but basically um, we want to try to infer decision boundaries of defender. We want to figure out what are what features are important in that classification process and what are what's limiting us when we go to actually modify the macros, but still maintain the functionality. So on the first proposal, uh, random forest classifiers, the first approach, it's nice because it can be trained in parallel. If you have a lot of data, that is important. And so this can speed things up. And the nice thing is, is that after we have a random force classifier trained, we can then extract out the decision paths to determine um, how these, uh, basically these uh, decision boundaries and determine why do certain decisions were made. Another nice thing about a random forest classifier is it will also give you what's called feature importance, which says that when it was trained and during its training process, these were the features that it used the most in making the decisions that it made, which means you can then focus on those features rather than spending your time on a bunch of things that probably aren't gonna matter and probably aren't gonna make that big of a difference. So, Talking about the macro, macro features and figuring out what's most important there, we'll start with a corpus of uh, benign and malicious VBA documents, and we'll let Defender give us the initial classification. Defender will tell us whether or not they're malicious or benign. And then we can extract out features using uh, the prior work, so maybe natural language processing, um, maybe some of the other features people have decided on, just personal experience with macros. We can, we can build upon a lot of this previous work. And then we're going to modify features to attempt to flip classifications. Now notice there, I don't say just to evade detection. I think it's just as important to be able to flip something from benign to malicious as it is malicious to benign, because it means you really understand why those, what's going into making those decisions. And at this point, it doesn't really matter what the macros do. Uh, we're not interested in that. It's just that we're more interested in the analysis here. So again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, when it comes to 
modifying images and videos for adversarial purposes, you have a lot of freedom there. I mean, as long as it still looks like an image or a video, you're fine. Not so much when it comes to code. And that's uh, has been one of the big blockers, I think, in this area of research progressing, is that just a small change can cause uh, something to no longer function, in our case, the macro. And so modifying existing macros might pose a huge challenge. And this is definitely something I am running into as a side note outside of this original presentation. It's it's quite difficult. So something you can do is you can start with uh, uh, macros that you write yourself with bare minimum functionality and kind of go from there, kind of build upon that. And again, prior work can help to guide these efforts. So with, uh, with these research projects, you want to pick a method of how you're going to go about this. How are you going to actually solve this problem and do this research? And so the approach that I am taking or that, I'm, that I will take is called design science. And we have uh, five main steps here, which we will go through each of those rather than me reading off all the bullet points. So the first is a problem investigation. And this is really handled already by the literature review. So in going through the literature review, I have, I have looked at the background of the problem. I have looked at what people have done, uh, where people are going and different tools that I can use. So step done with the literature review. Next is the treatment design, which also has a couple different parts. Uh, so when we talk about a treatment, uh, really what we mean is the kind of what comes out of the research. What is the actual solution? In this case, it's going to be a series of programs that help to address and solve this problem. And so that's going to be our treatment. Um, so just think of it as basically the software that comes out of it in this case. And so the treatment design is going to have a couple different steps. First thing is just getting data. Uh, when it comes to machine learning, getting data, getting good data is a big part of the battle, depending on what, what you're working on. And so there are some VBA data sets that are available uh, this, uh, from this website below, just a few thousand. Virus Total was another place it checked out. It turns out it's really expensive for just an individual. They do have academic access, and I was able to get just a few thousand malicious documents during that academic access window. There's also another really cool site, though, called Virus Share. Uh, you just uh, you just have to um, hit up, just reach out to the uh, to the owner of the site, and they'll grant you permission. Uh, the thing, though, about this is that it's not well organized. So things are just kind of clustered together into giant zip files. And when I say giant, I'm talking 80 gigs compressed. And the files within those zip files don't have extensions on them. So there's it's just hashes. And so I had to put together a pipeline that would go out, it would download these giant zip files, extract them out, try to determine based upon file characteristics of what type of files these actually are, pull those out, keep the ones I want, throw away everything else. And this netted about 100,000 uh, VBA files to play with. So this is all on the malicious side so far. Uh, we would also like benign documents to throw in to this process. Uh, Common Crawl is a place I've turned to for that. They essentially are just crawling around and archiving things on the internet. And down at the bottom there, there is a uh, link for a project that helps to, uh, to basically go through and grab the different types of files that you want off of, the, off of what's been archived. So data collection is just the, uh, the first portion of that. We still got to clean our data. This is another part that could be pretty time consuming. And so uh, just a high level portion here of what needs to be done is uh, stripping out the macros from the documents. Cause I want, I want the analysis to be done on the macros themselves. I don't want it to be done on something that might be in the document. Maybe it has an image or certain text that's typically associated with malicious documents and that's how it's making its decision. I don't want that. So I strip the macros out of the document so I have just the macros to focus on without any of the rest. Um, remove the duplicates, obviously, and there certainly is additional cleaning uh, that, that was involved, but we won't get into that here. But it's good if you have, again, garbage in, garbage out. You need good data. So <clears throat> which, this is uh, just kind of a repeat of something we saw earlier, but it's the uh, general approach here to, uh, to the problem, which is basically you have the data set that put together untrained model and target model. In this case, Defender is the target model. So we send the data set through the, uh, through the target model to Defender. It gives us predictions. We can use those predictions in the data set to train our untrained model. And then based upon what we find there, we can create new samples and then repeat the process until we are satisfied 
uh, that, that we know what we're doing, so to speak. So for the initial phases of this, uh, Defender will be kept in offline mode. Um, this is just to make, this is to ease the process a little bit because Defender updates frequently. And if, if, if you have a moving target, it is going to make things very, very difficult in the initial stages. So in the later stages, we can turn it on fully connected. That's great. But for the initial stages, just to keep things repeatable, it'll be in offline mode. Uh, we can get the predictions via a couple ways. Uh, the original way I proposed here was Windows event logs. I'm actually doing it a little bit different now, but uh, th those do exist. And one of the nice things about them is they give you more information than just bad or good. They can tell you uh, kind of the, the method they used, whether signature, heuristic, whatever, malware family, threat type, and then also interesting, uh, most, most interesting I think is severity. So rather than just good, bad, it's a scale of unknown to severe. So it's like, you know, kind of bad, uh, mostly good, really bad. Uh, it's a little, can be a little more useful than just good or bad binary. So we can pull that decision information using a C-sharp program. And then once we have uh, that information, so the decisions that were made and the data that was uh, fed to it, can use uh, Python with CUML for harnessing uh, GPU to train the RFCs because it uh, random forest classifiers because it greatly speeds up that process. And then to try to extract the decision paths out of there and then use C-sharp again to craft up new macro samples that have been modified based upon the information we've learned. And then we can throw those back at Defender, see what changes. Uh, this is the system uh, below that I put together, which compared to Microsoft stuff is fairly modest. Uh, 7th gen i7, uh, two high speed uh, M2 drives, which is very important because it's got a lot of disk operations, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, and an RTX 3080, which is almost certainly going to become a gaming graphics card when this is all said and done at some point. So, treatment validation uh, how well is this working? Well, that's kind of built into the artifact creation testing, it just kind of goes along with the process. Uh, the implementation. Now, this means we need to be able to get it out to people. Um, if people can't use it, that's not really worth um, much other than the uh, the knowledge that we can gain from it. But it should be able to be used in a way that doesn't require people to be programmers or have in-depth system knowledge or a bunch of domain knowledge. Uh, so it needs to be packaged up in an easy to use uh, way, if you will. And how I'm going to do this will be determined you know, kind of towards the end of things after everything's all kind of said and done all the work that is. So then with this design science, you typically have uh, implementation and evaluate or implementation evaluation. So usually you would work with your stakeholders here. You would determine who are your stakeholders, uh, who has the most interest in this, who's going to be using this. In this case, I would label it as law enforcement, Microsoft security contractors, potentially other uh, antivirus vendors in the future. But I don't think, um, as hopeful as I would like to be, I don't think the Microsoft's going to be like, oh, hey, Brian, do you want to come hang out in our environment? We'll just play around with this. That would be cool. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, maybe, I don't know, but probably not. So instead, I'll propose a series of other metrics that we can use to determine uh, how well to evaluate this. How, how well did this work? And the metrics it can use would be uh, the rate at which the macros that we create evade detection, the rate at which that transfers to other AV solutions. So that, that's a, a good thing to look at. So if I come up with uh, evasive or adversarial samples that fool one model, how well do those fool other models? How well does that transfer to other models that are out there? And also compare the performance to existing approaches. Uh, I mentioned some of those obfuscation programs earlier. If just blindly modifying the macros outperforms all of this, well, then this probably isn't uh, isn't as valuable of, of a thing to, to look into. So that certainly would be another metric that we'll look at. So uh, getting towards the end here, so just hang in there, promise. Uh, timeline, it just, uh, this was a very optimistic timeline, I will say, honestly, I was hoping to originally uh, be defending my final dissertation this month, uh, one year ago, that's what my hope was, uh, but it's uh, it's probably going to be more like in the spring is what I'm hoping for, but hey, <laughs> shoot high, I guess, so. Uh, getting, oh, all right, so almost there. 
So conclusions, um, basically what we're looking at here is what I'll call a closed box uh, Oracle or model extraction attack, meaning that I don't know, I don't have access to the model and I would like to know how that model is working. Proof of concept is going to focus on defenders macro analysis. Again, nothing against Microsoft. I love Microsoft. It's just, that's what's there. It's what's available. It's what we'll uh, you know just kind of play around with here. And so, uh, how we're approaching this is through a design science methodology, which we went through the different steps of that. And this is hopefully something that could be beneficial to uh, Microsoft, uh, law enforcement, and security contractors alike. So with that, a special thanks to Black Hills Information Security uh, for being awesome. Uh, South Dakota Governor's Center for Disruption of the Illicit Cyber Economy, who has helped to uh, fund and uh, guide some of this research, family and friends, of course as well as all the uh, members on my committee. So with that, uh, go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, we have a bunch of um, references. I will now read them line by line. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Be Yagoda, a short history of hack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done, Brian. Uh, so when you did that, like, is this how it all, how, how it happened? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yep, in front of my committee. And then, so the committee is made up of five people. You have uh, your chair, that's kind of the main mm -hmm. person on there, and then four uh, subcommittee members. So I had them and then some family that was uh, in the room too for support. Mm -hmm. uh, can you go ahead and kill your slides so that way we just go to straight? Yeah. Video? Yep. Let's do that. Uh, stop share. I'm going to bring up Discord, and then that way, if people have questions, uh, we're going to wrap it up here in four minutes officially, and then if we have any other questions, we'll stick around for just a, a few more minutes, if that is yep. the case. Uh, so, to, uh, you know, it did remind me of why I chose not to get a PhD, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> you just stick with your master's, huh? Is that what you're uh, no, to do? <laughs> I have an associate, but then, uh, so what I did, uh, Brian, instead of going to higher education, I bought a business. And so I like had a business. And so every single day, like it was, a, I wasn't getting a grade. I was either going out of business or <laughs> doing well. Uh, and then eventually I sold that business and then and it was okay. It was okay. Uh, we all have our own paths in life. All have our own paths. So you said you don't have it yet, right? You're waiting to hear. Um, so, so what I gave uh, there, that was the, um, that's what's called the proposal defense. Okay. So that's what you have to do before you can actually really start the research. Uh, so you go, you give that to your committee and they give you feedback on it. Like, uh, this is garbage, this is great. Oh, this is cool, but you need to make these adjustments. Once they've signed off on that, then you start the research work and then work towards your final dissertation. So that's the phase I'm in now. Gotcha. And so I'm hoping to, hoping mm -hmm. to get that stuff together by spring, at which case then I will graduate once I once I get that done. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh yeah. 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 To sum it all up, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh question from Warlock925. Brian, I'm looking at a PhD program before step one. How did you choose your terminal program? Uh that's a good question. Definitely make sure uh that uh, there, there are a couple different things with that. Uh, it's, I would say the biggest piece of advice is make sure that it is something that you are interested in, uh, something that is going to allow you to work on research work uh, that, that you really find interesting and you're passionate about. Uh, if you get stuck working on something you don't like, it, it's going to be miserable. It's going to just, you know, it's going to be that thing that's just kind of, um, you know, screaming at you in the back of your head that you need to do that you don't really want to. Uh, so certainly, yeah, just kind of just look at look at what you're interested uh, in. Look at um, some of the work that people have done in the programs at the different universities. Um, for me, uh, the the remote aspect of the coursework for the program that I went through uh, that was a big portion of it because I'm still working full time while working mm -hmm. on this, and so the remote aspect was was huge for me because otherwise I just I wasn't really going to be able to do it. So that's. Kind of some of the advice that, that I could give. Uh, so that follows into one of those, how is your work-life balance while studying for your PhD? 
<laughs> so uh, that's a good question. So it's definitely important to, for me, what has helped a lot is to set aside uh, specific times that you're going to work on schoolwork. So for me, for instance, it's Monday nights and Wednesday nights. So I'll usually get done with work uh, around maybe like four or so. I'll have like about an hour or so of me time, whether that's like playing video games or just something to unwind, go for a walk, something. But then after that, like school is what I am doing basically up until I'm, I'm too tired to work anymore. Uh, weekends though, weekends are, I make sure that I am not working uh, either on school stuff or on work stuff on the weekends. That's my family time. That's my recreational time, my friend time. So I think it's very important to, to put those blocks out, at least for me, it has been. So that way you're setting expectations and you're committing to, you know, doing, doing what you need to when you can. So we're going to wrap up the official Black Hills Information Security webcast today. Uh, Brian, any final thoughts? Like if you could sum up everything today in one final thought, what would it be? Oh, uh, if you have any interest in uh, going for a PhD, I would say look into it and just just go for it. Um, and if you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me and I am more than happy to give any advice or input that uh, you might be seeking. Well, thank you, Brian, for sharing your knowledge. For those of you that joined us today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we do this pretty much every single week, not next week because of all this hacking fest, mm -hmm. uh, but we do this every week. And the reason why we want to do it is because we want you to be better at what you do. Uh, we we genuinely, gen, gen, genuinely, genuinely, genuinely want you to be better in your careers, better at your jobs and better in life uh, because it brings us joy for you to find joy in what you do. And so thank you for joining us here today. Uh, if you don't know, we do penetration tests, thread hunts, active sock, anti-sock, which is continuous pen testing. Uh, we do all these things. Yeah. So if you ever want to hire us for that, feel free to do so. Uh, other than that, we'll see you at the next webcast. Brian, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to stick around the Discord and answer questions? Yeah. Is that, did I make that up? Brian? Oh, uh, sure. No, I, I can hang out. I'm not on the, uh, are we going to keep the webcast going or should I hop no. over to the Discord itself? Uh, yeah. Okay, Let's I can I'll hop over to the Discord. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the webcast is over. Yeah. This is post okay. show post banter. Show, yeah. uh, so okay. for those of you sticking around, if you are in Discord, feel free to use the job hunting chat, the career chat, the cert exam, prep help. Like these are all channels where you can go to and get help from the community. Uh, like this is a self thriving, self-sufficient mm -hmm. community uh, full of contributors, resources, Black Hills people. Brian might hop in here and answer some questions. So, um, Brian, yeah. what is your username? Just so I can kind of tag you. If anyone has any questions, they can tag you. Brian's like, I don't oh, know. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's full metal cash. Yes, I can it send is. it. I can send it over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got it. I got it. I found you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Brian, well done. Oh, awesome. uh, looks like you, uh, I had a question from email. Uh, so a real quick question from email. Maybe you can address it here. Didn't Microsoft just kill off VBA? No. So what they did was they have it. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit harder to enable it. So it's, let's just say it's a couple more button clicks that you need to go through. So it is, it, it's not, it doesn't run as easily as it did before, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still, you can still do it. It just takes a little bit more uh, coercing, let's say. <laughs> yeah every once in a while people will say they're like intimidated by our level of knowledge and it's just like well we get to do this every day mm -hmm. like you get to do this every day you get to push those buttons uh every day and you get hired a lot of times to push those buttons to figure things out and so mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't say be don't be intimidated we just get to do this a lot mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh how long did your dissertation process take from initial idea concept to final presentation uh, so if we're talking about getting to that defense portion, that was uh, probably about eight or nine months uh, going from the idea until I did that proposal defense in front of the committee. Uh, but that's on top of all of the of the coursework as well, uh, which was about two years or so worth of coursework and then another um, nine months or so of putting together what you saw today. Yeah. Are you going to want to be called Dr. Brian Furman or Dr. Furman or Doc Dr. Brian? Dr. Dr. Brian. Dr. Brian's great. I mean, if, if people people want to, that's I won't say no. No, nope. <laughs> I'll we'll, say no. Will we have to? Yeah, or yeah, you is it, no. Your your call. Your call. <laughs> Dr. Brian, we heard it here. Dr. Uh, Brian. Dr. Yeah. Brian. <laughs> Dr. Doctor. 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 Doctor.
Uh, what, what about a part-time PhD program? That is a question. What college can I look at for a part-time PhD program? <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so I think that, again, the remote options are probably going to be mm. uh, good. So Dakota State University, is uh, they have a pretty good program that is really built around people who are working full time. So the courses are completely are completely asynchronous. So basically you, you watch the videos and you do the assignments. There are hard deadlines for the assignments, but it's uh, more of, you know, work on it when you, when you have time, essentially in your free time, free time. Free time. So, yep. So DSU is, uh, I think, a great program for that. Uh, I think most of the rest of the stuff is just comments and people enjoying the yeah. commentary. Uh, when you go to see the doctor, will you let them know that you are also a doctor? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like, doctor. no, 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 I've actually, I've got this. I'm just showing Come up. On, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was uh, getting my surgery earlier, like when they wheeled me, wheeled me into the OR room, I was like, hey, just want to let you know, I've seen like 14 seasons mm -hmm. of Grey's Anatomy. So if you need me to pitch in at any time, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Scalp, scalpel me. Scalpel, scalpel me. Yeah. <laughs> scalpel me. Yeah. 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 The doc. Just, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Brian. Thank you for giving your webcast. Uh, we will. Uh, do you want to do like a follow up webcast when all this is done and you're Dr. Brian? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was really hoping this to, for it to be a, a multi-part series. So what we have here is just talking about what I would like to do and what I'm actually currently working on. So I would like to do a follow-on webcast later uh, to talk about what I have actually done okay. and some of the results that we've seen. So certainly I would like a, a future webcast to follow up with this yeah. one. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next week, we'll be at Wildwoods Hacking Fest. We won't be doing a webcast, but we'll be back the week after that with Tim Fowler, who's going to talk about hacking space. Because uh, All space, of it. Yeah, space. All is, of space. It's coming. Huh. Space. Wow. The democratization <laughs> of space. <laughs> All right, Brian. We'll see you next time. All right. Ryan, yeah. kill it with Bye. fire. Kill it with fire. Kill